Welcome, my name's Deborah Walker, and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. So I'd like to welcome you all here today, and those watching online, delighted to have you with us. And today is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice. And praise the Lord that His mercies are new every morning. And I'll be glad about that. And you know, we only have today. So let's enjoy today. Let's make a joyful sound. And as we open God's word, let our hearts be soft and our ears open. Lord, that um, you will just write your word on our hearts, Lord, and, and just continue to give us a revelation of what you are doing in the earth. From this day forward through to your return, it's going to be absolutely exciting and marvelous and wonderful. And we've all been called to be a part of this. And so this is really exciting and we are in the exciting times and this generation, you know, hallelujah, we are so thrilled to be in this generation. And today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called from glory to glory, from glory to glory. And I'm just going to open my King James Bible and let's just read what Jesus said in John chapter three and verse three. Verse 3, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And the Amplified says, Jesus answered him and said, I assure you, most solemnly, I tell you that unless a person is born again anew from above, he cannot ever see, know, be acquainted with, and experience the kingdom of God. And as with believers, we understand that Jesus was not talking about being born again naturally, but rather being born again spiritually. And then if we turn over to John 14, verse 6, Jesus said here, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So Jesus is the only way to the Father. There is no other way or means to the Father. And, you know, when we were convicted of our sin and confessed and sought God's forgiveness, then we repented of our sins. We turned away from our sins and started to walk God's ways. And we turned away from a lifestyle of sin and put our faith in God. Hallelujah. Knowing that Jesus died on the cross, taking our punishment and then after three days, he rose from the dead. And this change, this conversion took place in our heart. And it's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not just a matter of, um, you know, lip service. Conversion is something that happens in the heart. You are changed from the inside. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and this experience, this conversion is being known as born again. And even so, born, being born again is only just the beginning of, our, of God's wonderful plan for our lives. It's just the beginning. Some people stop at salvation. No, that's just the beginning of God's wonderful plan for your life. Let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. God's word instructs us how to walk the walk. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2. It says here, Wherefore laying aside all malice, that's wickedness, sinfulness and so forth, and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. So we just put all that, all right? That's no longer part of our lifestyle, who we are. As newborn babes, that's spiritual babes, desiring the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Let's read it from the Amplified. So be done with every trace of wickedness, depravity, malignity, and all deceit and insincerity, pretense, hypocrisy, and grudges, envy, jealousy, and slander, and evil speaking of every kind. Like newborn babies, you should crave, thirst for, earnestly desire the pure, unadulterated spiritual milk that you may be nurtured and grow unto completed salvation so we are saved at, at when we're born again but we are also being saved that we might grow up into the things of god 
And just as a natural baby requires milk to sustain their growth, so too new believers also need the milk of the word to grow spiritually. Have you ever heard the expression like father, like son? Well, spiritually, we have been born into the father's kingdom. And so who are we going to become like? Our heavenly father with his full character and likeness. That's his plan. We are his children and children are to grow up to the likeness of their father. And so who saw the glory of God, the children of Israel? Let's turn back to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. And they saw the glory of God in a cloud. Exodus 16 and verse 10. And it says here, And it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. They also saw the glory of the Lord on Moses' face. And to get the context, let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll just read here verses 1 to 6. <clears throat> Do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifest, declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit gives life hallelujah and in the time of moses you know god's word was written on literally tables of stone but as believers god is writing his word on our hearts in here not up in our head not in our brain box in our heart in our innermost being and let's just read on verse 7 it says here but if the ministration of death written and engraven on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall we not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious for the ministration of condemnation, which is under the law, be glory. Much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in its respect, in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remains is glorious. Hallelujah. This is saying there was a glory under the law. But now there's going to be a greater glory and there is a greater glory under God's grace. Hallelujah. Let's read on verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face and the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil taken, taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall return to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. When people turn to the Lord, whether they're Jew or Gentile, the veil is taken away. And let's just read that from the Amplified. Verse 12, it says here, Since we have such glorious hope, such joyful and confident expectation, we speak very freely and openly and fearlessly, not do we, nor do we act like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze upon the finish or the vanishing splendor which had been upon it. In fact, their minds 
were grown hard and calloused. They had become dull and had lost the power of understanding. For until this present day, when the Old Testament, the Old Covenant is being read, that same veil still lays on their hearts, not being lifted to reveal that in Christ it was made void and done away. Yes, down to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies upon their minds and hearts. But whenever a person turns in repentance to the Lord, the veil is stripped off and taken away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it was the same for us. Before we repented, we were spiritually blind. And we had, as it were, a spiritual veil on our heart towards God and spiritual things. But when we repented, we began to see clearly the things of God. Hallelujah. And our spiritual eyes, our spiritual heart was enlightened. Glory to God. Another person who saw the glory of the Lord was Solomon. Let's turn over to Second Chronicles chapter 5. Second Chronicles, Kings Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 5. And Solomon, he made this um, house, this big temple for the Lord. And Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated and the silver and the gold and all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. Let's go down to verse 11 and it says here, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests were present, that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. And also the Levites, were the, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in, listen to it, white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests, sounding with trumpets. And it came to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one, to make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Then, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. God wants to fill our house. And you know, we are the priests of the Lord and the trumpet speaks of the word of God. And there is one body, one faith. And at the moment, we know there's a mixture of doctrines throughout God's church. However, God's ministries, they're going to declare the truth of God's word, which will bring the body of Christ into a unity. Glory, God. Glory to God. Amen. And when the body of Christ comes into unity, just like foreshadowed here, when there's unity amongst the trumpeters and the musicians, that's the ministries and all those serving God, when there's that unity comes in, the glory of God's going to come in. Hallelujah. Because God blesses unity. Hallelujah. All right. So what is glory? We've talked about it, little bits, examples, but what is glory? The word glory, it's expressed in many words such as majesty and splendor, uh, dignity, glorious, honor, magnificence and light. And let's just go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John, chapter 1. And we read of Jesus here in verses 1, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. It says here, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not 
that verse 5 in the Amplified, it says, And the light shines in the darkness, for the darkness has never overpowered it, put it out or absorbed it or appropriated it, and is unreceptive to it. Light dispels darkness. You know, you've walked into a house at night time and it's dark. What do you do? You put the light on. Dark just goes, doesn't it? We just put the light on. And when we were born again, we became illuminated in our spiritual man. Hallelujah. And God delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. Hallelujah. And verse 14, it's speaking of Jesus and the word who in Jesus, of course, is God, the word made flesh and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. Let's read verse 14 in the Amplified. And the word Christ became flesh, human, incarnate and tabernacled fixed his tent of flesh, lived a while among us, and we actually saw his glory, his honor, his majesty, such glory as an only begotten son receives, receives from his father, full of grace, favor, loving kindness, and truth. Praise God. Jesus, he displayed the glory, honor, and majesty of his father. Amen. Amen. And who else saw the glory? Let's turn over to Matthew. Turn back to Matthew chapter 17. And we read here in verses 1 and 2. And it says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun. And his raiment was white as light. And that word transfigured, it actually means metamorphosis. And it means to change or transform. For example, you know, a caterpillar changes into a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. And as believers, we are being changed. Through God, we are going to metamorphose from a mere natural man into the likeness of God. God. Hallelujah. Let's just read those verses in the Amplified. And six days after this, Jesus took with him Peter, James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And his appearance underwent a change in their presence. And his face shone clear and bright like the sun. And his clothing became as white as light. Well, how exciting. How exciting. And just like Peter, James and John, as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we will see his glory. Hallelujah. If they saw it, God's no respecter of persons. For those that will press in and be all that God would have them to be, they're going to see his glory. And so that call is for all of us. Hallelujah. Because God wants to manifest his glory in the earth so that people will see God's glory and be gathered to him. Because he said, if we lift him up, he's going to draw all people. Hallelujah. Let's turn back to Psalm 1. God's word, it changes us. It's alive and powerful. And in Psalm 1, we read here an instruction. And it says here in Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. You know, do we delight ourselves in the word? And, you know, just as we eat natural food every day, we need to eat spiritual food every day. You know, natural Israel, they were instructed to gather the manna. Well, God's word hasn't changed. And we need God's word every day. And why is that? Because God's word feeds our spiritual man. And this scripture says we're to be in it day and night. And, you know, we are what we eat naturally and spiritually. So as we feed on him, feed on the word, get into the word, we will become more like him. We've got to eat the book. Eat the book. Remember John, book of Revelation? He was given a small book and he said, eat the book. He was told to eat the book. That means we are to digest it, 
not literally the pages and put them all in our mouth, but it's the text. It's God's word that we put, we, we digest into ourselves. And then God's able to write it on our hearts. Praise God. And Psalm 19, it says here in verses, starting verse 7 here, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the law are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. That's the reverential fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, God's word, is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, keeping of God's word, there is great reward. Hallelujah. God's word is pure. God's word is perfect. And the word of God, it's absolutely pure. There's no lie in it. It's absolutely the truth. And it's right. All God's word is true and right. And God's word is powerful. And it changes us into God's image from being simple to becoming wise, making wise the simple. And David is also saying here that God's word is to be desired more than gold, more than money, more than other things that people call precious. God's word is more precious. And we each need to make time every day to get into God's word. I know we all have busy lives and we all have responsibilities. But we're talking about eternal things. And this life, as we know it, is going to pass away. But what we have in God is for eternity. And so we've got to, you know, weigh things up in the light of eternity. Praise God. Let's turn over to James chapter 1. And verse 22, let's start there. And we're exhorted here. Be ye... But be you doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the word, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. It said there and continues therein. We just keep at it. We just keep at it. Continuous means you just keep at it. Let's read it from the Amplified, verse 22. But be doers of the word, obey the message, and not merely listening to it, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. For if anyone only listens to the word without obeying it and being a doer of it, he's like a man who looks carefully at his known natural face in the mirror. For he thoughtfully observes himself and then goes off and promptly forgets what he was like. But he who looks carefully into the faultless law, the law of liberty, and is faithful to it and perseveres in looking into it, being not a heedless listener who forgets, but is an active doer who obeys. He shall be blessed in his doing, his life of obedience. That's what I really enjoy about God's word. It's very clear. It's very clear. And uh, no ambiguity. It's just clear. And, um, and so just as an example, I was just saying, you know, God's word exhorts us to gather the manner every day, to read the word every day. And I'm saying, you know, let's read the word every day. And then if you go home today and you don't look at your Bible for a whole week, or if I don't look at my Bible for a whole week, that we were just like that example. We would be being deceived, saying, oh, it doesn't matter. It's all right. God understands. God knows my heart. Actually, God knows our hearts. And that's why he exhorts us to keep getting into his word, because it's his word that's going to keep changing our hearts and making us more like him. Hallelujah. So that's the exhortation just to keep at, just to continue in the things of God and in his word. Praise God. 
And so God has given us his word so he can, we can learn of his ways of doing and being right. It's um, he, God's ways of doing and being right. And uh, this word changes us from the inside out, gives life. And, uh, and we said before, light, it lightens us up. Hallelujah, spiritually. And Jesus is coming again in glory. Let's turn back to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Just reading here, verse 24. And then Jesus said unto him, to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to to his works. Let's read that from the Amplified, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any man desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, and forget himself and his own interests, and take up his cross and follow me. Cleave steadfastly to me, conform wholly to my example in living and if need be, in dying also. For whoever is bent on saving his temporal life, his comfort and security, he shall lose it, eternal life. And whoever loses his life, his comfort and security here for my sake, shall find it life everlasting. For what profit, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life, his blessed life in the kingdom of God? Or what would a man give as an exchange for his blessed life in the kingdom of God? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory, the majesty and splendor of his Father with his angels, and then he will render account and reward every man in accordance with what he has done. Hallelujah. And so whatever sacrifice we make, it cannot be compared to what God has prepared for us. You know, as we, as we give over our life, give ourselves a living sacrifice, give over to the Lord, it has an eternal weight of value. Praise God. It's going to be worth it. Every sacrifice, God sees every sacrifice. God sees every yielding. And um, God just sees it, all right? And so, and it's for our benefit. It's, uh, it's going to be rewarded. And it's not as out of out of works, but it's because we love him, because we love him. That's the best reason to do what we do. It's because we love him. We love him. He first loved us, and that's why we love him. And he sacrificed everything so that we could be gathered in. So how precious and valuable is that? And we need never lose sight of that. He loves each person, and he wants the best for every life. And uh, he's made a way where we can come into that fullness of abundance of life here and hereafter. Praise God. Hallelujah. And let's turn over to Second Peter chapter 1, because we are being changed from glory to glory. First, Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. And let's just read here, starting verse 1. It says here, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness and God and our Saviour Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of, our, of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption 
that is in the world through lust. We're just going to read that in the Amplified, just please. Uh, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle, special messenger of Jesus Christ, to those who have received, obtained an equal privilege of like precious faith with ourselves in and through the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. May grace, God's favour and peace, which is perfect, well-being, all necessary good, all spiritual prosperity and freedom from fears and agitating passion and moral conflicts be multiplied unto you in the full personal and precise and correct knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. For his divine power has bestowed upon us all things, all requisite and suited to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of him who called us by and to his own glory and excellence, virtue. By means of these, he has bestowed upon us his precious and exceeding great promises so that through them you may escape by flight from the moral decay, rottenness and corruption that is in the world because of covetousness, lust and greed and become sharers, partakers of the divine nature. It said in verse 3, he has called us. He has called us. You've been called to be a part of what God's doing. And he wants us to let, not be a part of what the world's doing and all the greed and the covetousness. Right? We've been called out of that. And verse 5, so this is what he says. This is the exhortation here, verse 5. And besides this, giving all diligence, Add to your faith, so we start off with faith towards God, right? Faith, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. The Amplified says, for this very reason, adding your diligence to the divine promises, employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue. That's excellence, resolution, Christian energy. And in exercising virtue, develop knowledge and intelligence. Verse 6, King James, and to knowledge temperance and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness. Amplified verse 6. And in exercising knowledge, develop self-control. And in exercising self-control, develop steadfastness, patience, endurance. And in exercising steadfastness, develop godliness, piety. You know, we do go through different things, don't we? And they are very challenging but it brings out steadfastness. It brings out long suffering. It brings out uh, patient endurance. That's part of God's character being developed in us. He's so patient. And verse seven, and to godliness, brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness, charity in the Amplified. And in exercising godliness, develop brotherly affection and in exercising brotherly affection, Develop Christian love. That's what charity means. It's God's love. And let's read on verse 8 to 10. It says here, For if these things be in you and abound, they make that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Hallelujah. Let's read that from the Amplified. Verse 8. For as these qualities are yours and increasingly abound in you, they will keep you from being idle and unfruitful. Unto the full personal knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. For whoever lacks these qualities is blind, spiritually, short-sighted, seeing only what is near to him and has become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. Because of this, brethren, be all the more solicitous and eager to make sure, to ratify, to strengthen, to make steadfast your calling and election. For if you do this, you will never stumble or fall. Right, we just keep at it. We keep in the things of God. We keep pressing forward in the things of God. We keep in the word of God. We keep praying. We keep believing. Hallelujah. We keep continuing. Hallelujah. And we are being changed into God's glorious perfection. 
Let's turn over back to Hebrews chapter 6. And we're just going to read here the doctrines of Christ. As I said, we're being changed into God's glorious perfection. Let's read here in verse 1 and 2. It says, 1, 2 and 3. Therefore, laying the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. All right. The six doctrines are repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Right? We repent of our old ways. We repent of sin and have faith towards God. Baptism, it says baptisms, but it's baptism in water, full immersion, as well as baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Number four is um, laying on of hands, and that's receiving an impartation. And number five is resurrection of the dead, and that's a spiritual resurrection. We know there are natural resurrections but what god is doing is throughout his whole church he wants everybody to receive salvation he wants them all to be water baptized he wants them all to be filled with the holy spirit he wants them all to experience the laying on of hands and he also wants them all to experience resurrection of the dead which is a spiritual resurrection it's a it's a fresh renewal it's a coming alive of his church all right it's for all believers and number six is eternal judgment and eternal judgment was functioning in the early church. For example, Ananias and Sapphira, you know, they dropped dead in church because they lied. They, they put forward a deception. It was a lie. And they just paid the penalty for that because <clears throat> God is truthful. So we've got to always speak the truth. And in the early church, all those six doctrines were functioning. However, the early church was not permitted to go on to perfection. Then when false prophets came in and false teachers came in to the early church, the early church went into a spiritual decline, which is known as the Dark Ages. Meanwhile, that all happened back then, but now we're right down here, right? God's end time church worldwide is to experience the full restoration of those six doctrines of Christ. And then we will go on to perfection, God's full glory. All right. So the whole six principles need to be operating and then we'll go on to God's full glory. And the restoration of these principles to God's church they commenced firstly approximately about 15 out after the Dark Ages, approximately 1513, was the first doctrine restored to God's church. It was repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Then in 1642, water baptism by full immersion was restored. And then the early 1900s, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking tongues was restored. Went through so many churches, all sorts of churches. It was amazing. And, uh, and even, even these days, there are so many different churches, people in there, spirit filled, water baptized, hallelujah. And then 1946 was the laying on of hands restored. And then in the late eight, 1980s, the resurrection of the dead, which is a renewal, a coming alive of God's church was restored to the church. And then the next doctrine to be restored to the church is eternal judgment. Meanwhile, today, many in God's church have experienced at least five of these doctrines. At salvation, we experience repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Then we experience water baptism, which is full immersion in water. And then we are baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Some have been saved. Some have been saved and water baptized. Some have been saved, water baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Some have experienced the impartation of uh, laying on of hands. And number five, and some have experienced a resurrection of the dead, a coming alive 
You know, they just were off the boil and now they're back alive. They're going for God and they're going again. But the sixth doctrine, eternal judgment, is still to be restored to the end time church. And judgment is coming to God's end time church. Before God judges the world, he's going to sort his church out first. Let's turn to it. First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, it says here, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? The Amplified says, For the time has arrived for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the end of those who do not respect or believe or obey the good news, the gospel of God? Only after the sixth doctrine, eternal judgment is restored. Will God's church then go on to perfection and truly experience God's glory? And where do we see God's glory? Let's turn to it in the heavens. Let's turn back to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. In verse 1 it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. And the Amplified says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows and proclaims his handiwork. So what do we see when we look up into the sky, up into the heavens? The sun, moon, and stars. And what are they? They are light. These declare God's glory. And verse 2 it says, Day unto day, utter a speech and night unto night shows knowledge. What's in the sky, what's in the heavenlies is, is speaking to every person who has ever lived. Doesn't matter which generation they lived. Every night and every day, the heavens declare the glory of God, that there is God. God exists. And so that man and woman is without excuse. And this is confirmed in Romans chapter 1. And verse 20, it says here, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They're without excuse. And where else do we see the glory of the Lord? In the word. Let's turn to Second Corinthians. Chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, it says here, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Let's read it from the Amplified. Verse 17, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, emancipation from bondage, freedom. And all of us, as with unveiled face, because we continue to behold the word of God, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are constantly being transfigured. Did you hear it? Transfigured. Remember, Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. They call it the Mount of Transfiguration. He was transfigured. Now here, it's saying that when we behold the word of God as a mirror, the glory of the Lord, we are, are constantly being transfigured into his very own image in ever increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Hallelujah. How exciting is that? God's word is alive and powerful. And as we continue to look into God's word, we are being changed into his likeness, into his glory. From one degree of glory to the next degree of glory to the next degree of glory and so on. Into his very likeness, into his very image, fullness, perfection. Hallelujah. 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 And where else are we going to see God's glory? In God's end time church. 
Now, I'm just going to turn to Haggai. It's one of these little skinny books in the Old Testament. It's uh, just before Zechariah, so it's about the third last book in the Old Testament. Haggai chapter 2. And we're just going to start here in verse 1. It says here, In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison as of it as nothing? The seventh month, right? It says in the seventh month, always speaks of tabernacles. And tabernacles is always the culmination of God's plan. Let's read on. Verse 4. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. Verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory says the lord of hosts the silver is mine and the gold is mine says the lord of hosts the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former says the lord of hosts and in this place will i will give peace says the lord of hosts hallelujah 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 Hallelujah. It says here, the silver and the gold is mine. We're not talk God's not talking about natural silver. Of course, he owns everything. But the silver prophetically or spiritually speaks of Pentecostal Christians, those that are spirit filled. But the gold always speaks of tabernacles, tabernacle Christians, those that have grown up to fullness. Hallelujah. Those who are going to measure up to God's full spiritual maturity. All right. So, you know, like we understand um, the Olympics, don't we? There's gold, silver and bronze. Well, <laughs> why be bronze when God wants you to be gold? All right. So let's keep the vision up there. God wants us to keep pressing in to be the, in the gold in tabernacles. And we are in the end times. And, af and after God has fully prepared his church, his bride, she will shine being full of his glory his light she will be full and the bride is made up of males and females that bride group will be full of his glory and then watch the uh, an ingathering that this world has never seen because tabernacles is the feast of ingathering and it's the fruit harvest coming in the fruit of the land hallelujah all nations let's turn to isaiah chapter 60 we're just talking about the bride here. She's going to be full of his glory, his light. And Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 to 3, it says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee and the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Let's read it from the Amplified verse 1. Arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Rise to a new life. Shine. Be radiant with the glory of the Lord. For your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and dense darkness all peoples. But the Lord shall arise upon you, O Jerusalem, and his glory shall be seen on you. 
and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. So this is all prophesying about the bride. And it is a time, we're in the end times, and it's a time of great spiritual darkness. But when it's dark, that's when light shines the best. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Light stands out in darkness. And even now, right now, even today, we shine as lights in this dark world. People will be drawn to the light. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So be encouraged. Everything that God does has purpose. And we've been called for such a time as this. And so in summary, what is God's purpose? That we may spiritually grow up and be changed from glory to glory into his very image and likeness. Glory to God. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.